It's been a little minute. It's been a couple of weeks. I missed you guys. Hope you had a great break. Um, hope you were able to be with family and be with friends. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. Can you believe it's 2024? 2020. Don, can we hit those lights? 2024. Hey, if you, if over the last two or three weeks, if you did not get sick, I need you to come pray for the rest of us because I'm pretty sure... <laughs> 99% of us have had some sort of, we actually kept passing like two or three things around the seven of us in the Saturday home. So it's probably our fault that all of you got sick and I, I repent for that, but we're working our, on our immune systems, we're taking the vitamin C and vitamin D, trying to get ourselves in order. And uh, Banner's actually the gatekeeper of, of all that. He sucks his thumb and he picks up everything that exists out there in the world. Um, and so, but we had a good break. Uh, we did miss you guys. We were able to get out to the farm a little bit and uh, get out in the country, take some deep breaths, and uh, it does a wonder for the soul. Um, and so I hope you are able to take some time and, and uh, take a deep breath and enjoy what God's given us, whether it's a lot or a little. Um, there's great power and joy and, and gratitude. And so um, if you're hanging out with us, for the first time, hey, glad you're here. Thanks for coming. Uh, we are building a kingdom community of wholehearted disciples who bring heaven to earth. That's what we're up to. That's what we're doing. And uh, we'd love for you to be a part. And we have a card uh, on the back table or over here in the corner. We'd love to know that you are here and just get to text you and thank you for coming. Um, we're going to read the Bible this morning. We love the Bible because it's, it's, it's one of the ways that we encounter and experience Jesus. And so if you could grab a Bible, you can use your phone. We also have some physical copies on the table back here. We'd love for you to grab one. If you need a Bible at home, feel free to take one of these. Uh, we'd love for you to have that. Um, and um, we're going to look at a couple different scriptures, so I'd really like for you to follow along with me um, as we study the word together this morning. Um, and we'll be in 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, so if you could go ahead and turn there. This is Paul's second letter to the church in Corinth. It's actually uh, one of four letters he wrote to the church in Corinth. They were struggling, y'all. And uh, in 2 Corinthians, he mentions two other letters. One is his tearful letter. One was a letter that was lost. And uh, this, this is either his third or fourth letter, actually, he wrote to them. And Paul loved this church. And he had great love. And uh, he, he challenged them a lot as they were going through it and facing distractions, facing temptations. And, um, and uh, this, this is really the passage in 2 Corinthians 4 that... I felt like God was leading us to as we kick off this year together. Um, so we're going to read chapter four, starting in verse seven. Are you there? All right, here we go. I'm reading in the NLT. We now have this light shining in our hearts, but we ourselves are like fragile clay jars containing this great treasure. This makes it clear that our great power is from God, not from ourselves. We are pressed on every side by troubles, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed, but not driven to despair. We are hunted down, but never abandoned by God. We get knocked down, but we are not destroyed. Through suffering, our bodies continue to share in the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be seen in our bodies. Yes, we live under constant danger of death because we serve Jesus so that the life of Jesus will be evident in our dying bodies. So we live in the face of death, but this has resulted in eternal life for you. But we continue to preach because we have the same kind of faith the psalmist had when he said, I believed in God, so I spoke. We know that God who raised the Lord Jesus will also raise us with Jesus and present us to himself together with you. All of this is for your benefit. And as God's grace reaches more and more people, there will be great thanksgiving and God will receive more and more glory. 
That is why we never give up. Though our bodies are dying, our spirits are being renewed every day. For our present troubles are small and won't last very long. Yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. So we don't look at the troubles we can see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen. For the things we see now will soon be gone. But the things we cannot see will last forever. Let's pray. Father, we, we thank you for your word. God, we thank you for the opportunity to gather as a kingdom community and get to read your word and enjoy your word. And thank you, God, that as we read it together, you promise to be here with us and that it's more than words on a page. God, this is one of the ways that we can experientially know you. And so, God, I ask that you'd speak to us. God, we do lift up our beloved saints God, we pray for a victory today in the name of Jesus. God, we pray, God, that the Bucks would lose horribly. God, we pray that the Packers would lose horribly. God, we pray that the Seahawks would lose horribly. God, that you would part the Red Seas and make a way for us to go. Oh, we don't want this season to be over. Some may want it to be over, but we don't want it to be over, God. We love this sport and we love you. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. All right, let's go home. Thank you, Lord. <clears throat> so as I was um, asking the Lord for um, what he wanted us to go to today, um, I felt like the only thing he really gave me was just to, to pray for you guys. And uh, so as best I could, I wrote out everyone's name in our church. And uh, you know, so it's 70, 70 or so adults I, I wrote down. Uh, you guys who, who are part of our church, consistent and coming and a part of this community. And, and, uh, and so I was praying for you. And many of you, you know, because our church is smaller, I'm able to kind of be and somewhat in the know of like what, what's going on in your life and like what you're walking through and what you're journeying through. And for others of you who I, who I don't know as well, it was cool because as I was praying for you, I felt like God was showing me th things that you're facing, things that you're journeying through, not specifics, but, but just in general sense, I felt like I was sensing, oh, this is how I should pray for this person. And um, several of you I texted this week and just let you know I was praying for you. And, and um, as I was doing that, you know, I was, had your name and then just a little note about how to pray for you. And... Um, it was crazy just because so many of us are going through trials and going through suffering and facing hardship in some form or fashion. And whether it's pain or heartache or disappointment or a need for provision, um, it's, it's interesting that God has really uh, pieced together this community of people who... Um, who are going through it, you know, and it, it's not everybody, but, but most of us, many of us are facing some sort of trial, facing some sort of hardship. And, um, and as I was praying for our church this week, I was filled with such hope and I was filled with such expectation, even in the midst of, of much suffering, even in the midst of much lack or needs. And, um, and what I believe God wants us to know today as we go into 2024 is, is that our suffering is not in vain and that nothing is wasted in God. Um, everything we are doing right now is productive. And that's what Paul tells us. I love this scripture. I love this, this passage. Um, Paul, this is considered like his most intimate and vulnerable letter to any of any of the churches and um and he's he starts off if you could just look back at it with me real quick he starts off saying hey we are like fragile clay jars anybody felt like fragile clay lately just like man at any moment i feel like i could break at any moment i feel like i could crumble um but were these fragile clay jars why because we contain this great treasure 
And it's clear because we are so fragile that anything good in our lives is not because of us. It's because of what he's doing. It's because of who he is. That's the beautiful part of this. Um, in verse 8, he's, it's this beautiful poetry of like we're pressed on every side by troubles, but we're not crushed. We are perplexed, but we're not driven to despair. We're hunted down, but never abandoned by God. We get knocked down, but we are not destroyed. It's this, this promise that God sustains us. And there's this theme that even in the midst of death, there's so much life that God can birth through the things that feel like death in our lives. And in verse 16, um, Paul implores us to never give up. I was talking to someone this morning for church and just the only thing I could encourage him with was don't give up. Don't give up. Paul says, though our bodies are dying, has anybody felt a little bit of dying in this past season? Our spirits are being renewed every day. For our present troubles are small. Now, with the dying part, I'm like, okay, Paul, I'm with you. And then when he calls my trials small, I'm like, okay, Paul, you lost me. It's not small. And, and what I'm facing personally is small potatoes compared to what Paul was facing. And so what, what does this mean? Because it doesn't feel like there's anything small about what life feels like sometimes but he says these troubles are small they won't last very long so he's comparing our trials and the length of those trials to heaven to eternity to the reality of that he says these troubles they produce everyone say produce they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. They produce. They produce. I was talking to someone this week. He was encouraging me. And he said, hey, the suffering is the work. The trials are the work. When, when you're suffering with Jesus, when you're going through something and you're doing your best to do it with an awareness of Jesus with you, it's productive. There's, it's, it's, it's hard work, but there's something that God's doing that can only happen in that circumstance, in that situation. And this is our promise to hold on to. There's something God is doing. Are you guys with me? So for our family, you know, we, we have felt very stretched in this season, very dependent on him coming into the new year. You know, it's, it's funny um, just even sharing with our team before the service of like, today we're not preaching about resolutions and reaching your dreams and climbing to the top. We're talking about suffering. And, and this, this, if not, if nothing else, is a word of encouragement for me. But again, I, I, I know it's a word for all of us. Um, we've all felt very stretched. You know, for Lena and I, personal trials or trials our kids are, are facing or just feeling stretched of parenting young kids or pastoring. And we all have our own list. Um, and, and we don't like the way it feels. We just don't. We don't like hard things. We don't like pain, right? That's how we're wired. But the, the, the exhortation for us today as we step into something new this year is, is may we have a theology, a, 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 a revelation of God that knows how to embrace hard stuff, that knows how to trust God in the midst of whatever we're going through, to trust that God is in control of my life and there is something being produced in this that I need. There's something being produced in this that God, God thinks I desperately need this. Um, I need to have a perspective that sees things in my life as productive. Now flip one page over to 2 Corinthians 1, and we see a little bit more 
of why this is productive, why trials and hardship is productive. In chapter 1, verse 8, this is kind of his intro into the letter. He says, we think you ought to know, dear brothers and sisters, about the trouble we went through in the province of Asia. We were crushed and overwhelmed beyond our ability to endure, and we thought we would never live through it. In fact, we expected to die. But as a result, we stopped relying on ourselves and we learned to rely on God who raises the dead. So this is, this is the decision that you and I have. Is it, are we gonna be self-reliant or will we be reliant on God? Or will we try to kind of live in the middle? Sometimes I trust God. Sometimes I'm pretty committed to just doing things on my own and my own strength and figuring things out. So will I rely on myself who often feels dead or will I rely on God who raises the dead? That's, that's the, the option ahead of us. And this, this is what's happening as we face our trials, whether we like it or not or acknowledge it or not, as we go through life, the dips and valleys, we're, we are learning and training ourselves to either trust and rely on him or rely on ourselves. The way I know this process is happening in me over the last few months as there's been dips and valleys in life, different things to walk through that feel hard, um, in those moments of of feeling a bit crushed, the prayer that started to come out of me is, Lord, would you carry us? Lord, carry us. And my brain, you know, wants to take off and start trying to figure out how to fix this, how to change this, how to escape this. And yet there's this thing in the spirit that's happening in my soul where I know this is, this is here so I can learn how to, how to trust him, how to rely on him, how to relinquish control. And I feel, I feel so helpless at times. And, and all I can say is, Lord, would you just carry us? Lord, just carry us. I know if, if you carry us, we'll be okay, we'll have everything we need. You will carry us through. You will heal our bodies, right? You will, you will show us the path forward. You will provide for what we need. You know, the other day, Christmas Eve, um, it, was, it was crazy. We had multiple kids uh, vomiting, Lena's getting sick. We go to my grandmother's every year for my whole life on Christmas Eve, and we missed it. The first time in my life, I think. We were um, texting back and forth with her mother, who had to go to Dallas last minute because Lena's grandmother was in the hospital. And then, and then the cherry on top, I left my back window, not like a, a back seat window, like the whole back window in my truck that faces the bed will go down. And I left it open all day and it rained all day on Christmas Eve. So I had a lake in my truck and I found that in, at night, Christmas Eve. And, um, and so I was sending SOS texts to, to friends like Matthew, just like, yo, dude, I'm about to throw my head through a window. Pray for me, please. And, um, and in that moment, like, you know, that's, that's like a snapshot, I think, of what life can feel like for us sometimes, right? Just like things can kind of stack up. And, um, and, and that's a real thing that we face sometimes, like that, that crushing. And, and all that day, as these things are stacking up, like all I could really pray is just like, Lord, carry us. Lord, please carry us. Clean up vomit off our new carpet in the new house. Lord, I, I forgive Banner for this. Lord, carry us. Carry us. You know, and, and for me, it's still, it's still a, like a cry for help than it is like a real prayer of faith. So 
there's still growth that needs to happen. It's, it's still like a, just a desperate cry and that's okay, but it's something, right? It's something that's happening that's good fruit in my life where instead of throwing my head through a window or yelling at somebody, there's, there's something happening where I'm seeing, wow, God, I need you so bad right now. And that can only happen in hardship. It's just, the, it's just how he designed things, right? That, that, that sort of, of repenting from self-reliance and moving into a life of God-reliance only happens in the midst of, of trial, in the midst of hardship, in the midst of suffering, in the midst of warfare. That's where that happens. And um, day by day, season by season, you know, I'm slowly, my theology is, is, is growing here and learning to see uh, and learning to embrace this, right? We will have suffering. Jesus told us that. Until we stand in glory, we will have suffering. There will be highs and lows. Life is full of seasons. That's the beautiful thing. When we're going through a hard season, the, the best news is that it's not always going to be like that. You know, there's winter and there's spring. And so, and so God's designed it in that place, but we are, we are learning in this, in this way. And the reason God does it like this is because many of us, maybe most of us, we feel like pretty miserable most days, right? We're like, we're grinding, we're anxious, we're tired, right? We're, we're, um, we're heavy, right? I, I, I know you guys, I stay, I stay in your lives. I know myself, right? Life is, is hard, just life. And, and so th there is a reality where, where many of us feel like just pretty miserable most days. And God doesn't want us to feel like that. If you remember in John 10, Jesus actually like, promised us this life and he said it's a rich and satisfying life so so how do you have a rich and satisfying life how do you have that promise and then he also says like in this world you're gonna face like a butt ton of trouble and like really go through the ringer what does that mean like how do you how do you manage that tension and, and the reason is because both, both are true. And in his wisdom, he knows that it's only in the moment by moment trusting him that abundant life is found, right? It's only when we fully let go of our life that peace and joy and freedom is found. Any part of our life where we are in charge, where we are holding on to it, where we are calling the shots, that's a part of our life where anxiety, fear, comparison, and frustration will live. But it, it's, it's in the surrender, in the letting go, in the Lord carry us. God, I'm giving up. You carry us. God, I don't know the way out. You have to make the way out. God, I don't know how to fix this situation. You have to figure it out. That's where life is found. In the letting go, in the laying down, in the surrender, in the deeper place of relying on God to be who he says he is, to do what he said he will do. That's the secret, that's where it's found. And so God in his grace and his wisdom will allow us to experience weakness in situations that put us in need. So we can learn to rely less on ourselves so we can get to the end of ourselves in our own strength so we can find his strength. Now, if you flip all the way to the end of 2 Corinthians chapter 12, we have this famous text about this thorn in his side. And, um, and if you look at, look at it with me in verse seven, towards the end of verse seven, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, the end of verse seven, he says, so to keep me from becoming proud, or you could sub that out for 
to keep me from becoming reliant on myself and obsessed with my own abilities, my own skills, my own intellect. I was given a thorn in my flesh, flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment me and keep me from becoming proud. Three different times I begged the Lord to take it away. Each time he said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So now I am glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. That's why I take pleasure in my weaknesses and in the insults, hardships, persecutions, and troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. When I am weak, then I am strong. So we believe that God is good. We believe that God loves us. We believe that God doesn't cause pain, hardship. He doesn't inflict pain on us. He's a good and loving father. I'm a dad. I would never do anything to inflict pain on my children. And my heart as a father is a microscope snapshot of, of who our heavenly father is. But because he loves us, because he wants us to, learn, to step into full life, abundant life, rich and satisfying life, he will allow pain into our lives. He will allow us to face things that bring us to the end of our own strength so that we can learn to surrender. Because it's only in moment by moment surrender, moment by moment trust and reliance on him that we can experience real peace. We can experience real freedom. We can experience the things that we long for in our souls because that's what was in the garden. That's what was in the Eden. It was that sense of, of rich and satisfying fulfillment of peace, joy, hope. That's, that was the atmosphere. And so that's what we long for. And that's found in the letting go. It's found in the laying down, right? It's found in, in, in the full surrender. Jesus said, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. See, there's, there's the death that happens so that life can happen, real life. I'd love for you to read 2 Corinthians at some point. In, 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 um, actually, I'm sorry, it's in 2 Thessalonians I was reading this week, and he's talking about Hey, everything that God's doing in me, it's for your benefit. And you'll see as you go through life that there's trials you go through that then God will bring somebody into your life that now you get to use your story, use your suffering, even if it's not over yet. You get to share what God's doing in your life with that person. It becomes a gift to begin to offer. There's things I've prayed for years and years. God, heal me of this. If, one example, anxiety. God, heal me of anxiety. He hasn't healed me yet. But you know how many people I've been able to help and encourage who face anxiety? Hundreds, right? It, and, and God will put us in situations where the trial becomes a gift that then we can offer to somebody else. And the comfort that we experience from the Holy Spirit as we go through it, we can then turn around and comfort somebody else. You know, in 2024, um, the, the picture I, I, I had for us was, was just this. And I think, I think we... I think metaphorically and actually, we need, we need to do this in 2024. And there's a, there's a lying down that needs to happen, a, a laying down of control, a laying down of surrender, a laying down of our will, of our intellect. And... I love the picture of Jesus in the boat in the midst of storm and chaos and he's napping on the bow of the boat. And he, he knew that moment by moment trust in such a way that he could nap through storms that were threatening to kill a whole crew. And culture wants to teach us to flee from weakness and hustle through life and build our platform and have it all together and smile our way through life. But disciples of Jesus are to embrace weakness. 
and we're to welcome the the crushing that could come from life. We're to we're to see it as God sees it. Paul is, is exhorting us: don't look at that which is passing away. Look at that which is eternal. Don't be obsessed with the here and now. Be obsessed with heaven. If 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 embracing weakness is hard for you, if if you don't see that in God's heart, just skim the scriptures. Think about Abraham who who had no heir. Think about Sarah who who had missed her moment and was too old. Think about Jacob, who, who walked with a limp. Think about Joseph, who, who was forgotten and unwanted. Think about Moses, who stuttered. Think about David, who, who had a dark past. Think about Job, who faith, faced unfathomable difficulty. You can think about Peter, who was a denier. He was weak. You can think about Mary Magdalene. She was an adulterer. You can think about Paul. He was a murderer. God loves to use the weak. And there's rest available for us. I want to offer you one practical as I stand up and let the blood rush back to my body. I want to talk to you as I close about Sabbath, and um, let me try to connect the dots with the brief minutes I have left. Um, Sabbath is a way of laying down, and on my Sabbath each week, I try to take a nap. I'm not good at taking a nap, so I will actually lay down. Um, but it's a, it's, Sabbath is, is an exercise of trust. If if you didn't know it, God created us on the sixth day. So our, the seventh day was our first full day. The seventh day was the day of rest. Our first full day as human beings on earth was resting, not working, rest. And what it says, or what it doesn't say, is that there was evening and morning on the seventh day. It doesn't say that like it does the previous six days. The seventh day never ended. We, we live in a covenant of rest. We live as human beings from a posture of rest. That's how we were designed to live. We still work, but we were designed to work from rest. We were designed to, to do everything we do with a posture of rest. And there are some things we can only learn about God when we stop. Psalm 46 says, be still and know that I am God. Like we can't really know his heart and know what he's like until we literally stop. Until we stop all of our hustling, all of our grinding, and we pause. So Sabbath is about getting God back in view. It's about becoming reliant on him. If you've never had a weekly Sabbath, it's going to be hard for you because we've been trained by culture to work and to not stop. And when we do stop, typically we just are lazy and just veg out. But Sabbath is about purposeful, intentional rest and refreshment. And um, it's not about having nothing to do. We'll always have stuff to do, right? But it's saying, okay, today... I'm going to intentionally limit myself so I can remember that God's got me, that God's for me. It's reminding myself, am I the provider or is God the provider? Is life in this to-do list in the tasks ahead of me, are those things God or is he God? If you have kids or you work, Eight to five, Monday through Friday, it'll, it'll be hard to find a 24-hour period of time. But I want to challenge us this year to find a chunk of time in your schedule where you can Sabbath, where you can put the phone away, put the to-do list away, 
put work off of your mind and say, okay, this is a time for me to intentionally and purposefully let God be God, to not be dependent on me and my energy and what I can do or cannot do, but to trust him. If you're going through trials and hardship, you're saying, okay, God, as best as I can, I'm gonna give you that and take this chunk of time to enjoy life, to enjoy my family, to enjoy creation, to do something that's purposeful and refreshing because you are God and I am not. Um, and, and I think one thing I'd say is don't be legalistic about it. If it can't happen at the same time every week, that's okay. Um, for me, I love this quote where um, this, this Jewish rabbi said, if you work with your hands, Sabbath with your mind. And if you work with your mind, Sabbath with your hands. So if, if, if your job is mostly using your mind, it probably would be refreshing for you to do something with your hands, right? So for me, I've started to do yard work on my Sabbath because most of my week I'm in my mind working and it's actually refreshing for me to rake some leaves or cut some grass. And so I don't get legalistic about it because it's, it's, it's refreshing to me. So what does that look like for you based off what you're doing throughout the week? What does it look like to, to find that space, to find that, um, that place of rest, to, to say, okay, um, life is forcing me to either become reliant on me or on God. And I'm committed and disciplined to be a person who relies on him. And so, um, so I bless you to find ways to do that this year. And let's, let's keep talking about it. Let's, let's get creative on how we Sabbath, what that looks like, and um, encourage each other and share ideas. Um, and so that has been one of the most transformational rhythms in my life over the last four or five years is, is really being intentional with that. And so um, to close, to end, um, there's actually a song that um, I want us to listen to. And, um, and we're just going to go ahead and transition into a couple minutes of just, God, what are you saying? God, what, what do you want me to know this morning? And God, what, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? Wherever you are, if you're in a, a mountain season or a valley season, God, what do you want me to know when it comes to um, trusting you, when it, when it comes to having a posture of letting go, of, of surrendering? God, what do you want me to know? And, and God, what do you want me to do? God, what does it look like? To, to do what you've called me to do and embrace this place of weakness. And I believe in that the Holy Spirit will speak to us. This song is called Broken Melodies. And um, every time Lena and I have listened to it the last several months, it's, it's just really stirred us. And, um, and so I think we'll have the lyrics on the screen. Um, but I just want us to take these next couple minutes to sit under this song, let it just play over us. And um, to process with the Holy Spirit, let him speak to us, allow him to guide us in how to move forward. So, Father, we give you these last few minutes together. God, I ask that you speak, that you move, that you stir our hearts. Tell us what you want us to know. God, show us what you want us to do. Thank you, Lord.